Hey everybody, it's Drucker Time. Thank you for joining me once again for another episode of Ring of Honor Resurrected. We came off of a pretty good pay-per-view. Uh, one that I'm fairly satisfied with. I, I, overall, in terms of rating, maybe a little bit underwhelming, but we had a lot of people on the card, so that, that's not shocking. But what is shocking is the conclusion of the show in which Jay Lethal took the belt from Samoa Joe, the Foundation uh, gaining control once more, Jay Lethal getting another notch on his belt in terms of championship wins, obviously um, a long history in Ring of Honor with him. So becoming champion again, a big deal. Don't know if we're going to continue this story with Samoa Joe and him. Uh, would make sense, but we'll have to see. Other big things obviously happening. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of weird random stuff happening in the show, obviously. Uh, but Joe Hendry defeating Dalton Castle, meaning that he can no longer actually challenge Joe Hendry. Um, we're going to move Dalton Castle off to something else, but for now... The feud between him and Hendry is done. Willow Nightingale on the rise. Uh, some action between Tony Nese and Flip Gordon. And uh, obviously the sort of fallout from uh, Wheeler Yuta taking back the Ring of Honor pure title, defeating Tracy Williams, getting a bit of respect from his former friend, and um, Jordan Grace defeating Mercedes Martinez to win the Ring of Honor women's title so some big ones uh obviously there were some issues that we had where we really couldn't get uh the matches that we wanted on here so we have that follow-up where we have um uh some 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 tag action that we have to do so we know what we got to do here in terms of next pay-per-view though i'm not sure if we're going to do anything... Well, you know, we have Glory by Honor. Night 1, Night 2 in August. I think that... I think we'll keep those. Um, a two-night show is going to be a difficult one to book. Obviously, we have Death Before Dishonor in September. Manhattan Mayhem in October. Survival and Fitness in November. So we're still on that thing. I, I think it makes the most sense to probably maintain that, to try to build that momentum. We have a long way to go. To get to medium um a really long way to go and that is our goal by the end of the year and that is a hell of a challenge for for us here so as many pay-per-views as we can get is probably going to help us if we look at our progress here uh we've definitely made progress uh from the last couple months we're at a 40 but we basically have to get 15 points in a year in in size in that area. And actually, not even that area. That's the tri-state. We need it to be in the mid-Atlantic. So, I mean, we granted, we've we've made those moves, but we, we have a little bit further to go just in mid-Atlantic, and we need that in 59 and 35 in either southeast or the tri-state. That's, that's a bit of a move. So, you know... Uh, it's doable. It's going to be hard, and so I don't think it's smart to kill any pay-per-views. Uh, we want as many eyes as we can. I'm still concerned about what exactly is going on with our our pay-per-views. Um, we have fight for normal shows. Um. HBO has the rights for their uh, retain the right to show footage on their own broadcasting platform. That's us. Broadcast exclusive rights across the United States. That's fine. We should be getting money from these deals, but we're still not. And I haven't figured out why we're not getting any pay per view revenue. And the only thing I can think of is that maybe it's because we're owned by AEW, so all that money is going directly to them. I don't really know. That'd be kind of weird because I figure it should work the same where it all kind of comes into the coffers. So that's odd. Certainly, though, money is not the major issue right now. The major issue is making sure that Tony Khan is happy with our performance here. 
and also making sure that uh, we we don't get closed down. And the only way to do that is to make sure we're not running too much in the red, which I think we're doing okay. Only 6,000 in debt right now. We got a couple weeks to go, but we're not looking that bad. And uh, our major goal here is to get that size uh, growth. So as long as we do that and we avoid these little pitfalls of these other goals, which are not, are not going to be very difficult to deal with, I think we'll be fine. We don't actually have almost two years to do this, so should be okay. It's not as dire as it sounds, but it does mean we need to constantly be growing momentum. Um, so with that said, let's go ahead, let's sim on over to our next episode. Okay, a mid-Atlantic venue was picked for us, which is fine. We do have a backstage incident. A couple, actually. Um, Nick Jackson doing something. Uh, lifted the locker room with a silly game where he quickly created and uh, became very popular backstage, playing, I guess, that tossing cup game and um, making everybody happy. Everyone's happy. Everyone has their teeth. No doors were kicked down. Everything's happy in the Ring of Honor locker room. And we also have an incident with Austin Gunn and Minoru Suzuki. Um, Austin Gunn brought before a wrestler's court, accused of not joining the wrestle locker room for a night out. Of course, the judge, the scariest wrestler's court judge ever, Minoru Suzuki, found him guilty and sentenced him to buy him to buy drinks for everybody. And good thing, um, his incident that actually improved uh, his, his uh, outlook here. So Austin Gunn behaving a little bit better. We will meddle. We do have some negative feelings about being left off the show, I believe. Um, let's take a look here. So we will allow people to air it out a little bit. Um, not a huge deal, but you know something to kind of just rough round those rough edges a little bit and yeah so we're gonna get 368 people to the show uh our last pay-per-view did 1100 so you know our, overall actually our our actual attendance not doing too bad picking the best option just gave us a generic which is fine and we do want to be in mid-atlantic i believe yeah, we want to target this hard as long as the Southeast and the Tri-State are relatively covered, which they are. The Southeast still has a ways to go, but I believe we have a bleed-off effect from our location to the Southeast. So um, let's double-check that. Yeah, popularity spillover, Southeast, Great Lakes, and Tri-State. 40% of our popularity is going to funnel into there. So I don't think we need to target anywhere else. I think we just hammer in the Mid-Atlantic, do rounds in the state, in the region. And as long as we're targeting North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, that region, um, we are going to grow rapidly. We don't need to go to Tri-State. Uh, as much as I would like to go to 2300 Arena, we don't need to. And... You know, we just target here for now. So that's the goal. Let's go ahead and let's book our show. We got 90 minutes, my least favorite amount of time to book. And I'll catch you guys on the flip. Let's see what the next episode of Ring of Honor Wrestling has in store for us. All right, guys, we are back, ready for 95 minutes of wrestling, including two pre-show matches, just to give some people something to do. Um, you know, always hard in these post-pay-per-view shows to try to start to establish some storylines. We had some stuff happening 
in the end of the last pay-per-view. So we're kind of continuing some of that. The big marquee, obviously, is the match that we couldn't get done just because of the way there was timing issues happen. So FTR, Briscoe's Young Bucks, the three-way tag match for the Tag Team Championships, and obviously building some other storyline elements around it. So with that said, let's go ahead. Let's check out what Ring of Honor Wrestling looks like. We started off with a pre-show match. We got Austin Gunn and the Gun Club uh, versus the Seidel Brothers and Brandon Watts, um, giving the Gun Club a win here. They're one of our only trios acts, so we have to kind of build them up if they're going to be a challenger for the righteous at some point. And figure doing it on the pre-show is not a bad way to do it. Actually, overall, the match results itself pretty good. Got a 63 for Matt Seidel being the uh, top of the pack here. But everybody else kind of held their own. Uh, the guns probably being the weaker of the competitors. Brandon Watts with a surprising 36. So overall, not too bad. Uh, but the gun club does defeat this trio and uh, build up some reps for our six-man tag titles. Another one that I really wanted Dalton on the show, but just did not have any time. So um, still trying to figure out what I want to do with him moving forward. We definitely want to build him up. He's in a bad spot on this um, this database, though, uh, which is kind of shocking because he's only like rated at popularity like like thirty four under or something like that. So he's a guy with a lot of experience, a lot of technical skill but not a lot of popularity and um in a position where you know you'd want him higher on the card but it's going to be difficult to get him there so that's going to be about the build is that can we do it um can we we're going to do a parallel build actually joe hendry is going to be built up into a star separate from dalton and dalton's going to be built up as a star separate from joe hendry and while they can't collide now probably down the line but in a much bigger standing so uh it's gonna be kind of cool long term to see that develop but for now we have to develop castle so we're gonna have to give him a good storyline um leading out of this loss for now we're gonna give him some wins so dalton castle and alex jane's alex alex jane geez alex Zane have a pretty decent match. Dalton, again, have a 60. Again, in-ring performance skill, very solid. His popularity, uh, not great. And we'll take a look at, at tracking maybe next next episode to see uh, what their popularity tracking looks like. Presumably, it's going to get better, but we need to get them there eventually. Uh, overall, match is a 51, so not too bad. We start the show off proper with Jay Lethal and Jonathan Gresham. Lethal comes out <laughs> triumphantly, and uh, to start the show, he's dressed nice. He's in a full suit. You know, expect that sort of a uh, pompous Jay Lethal here holding the belt. He's holding it proudly. He's holding it smugly. And he announces to the crowd, Ladies and gentlemen, your new Ring of Honor world heavyweight champion has arrived um the crowd not very happy obviously lethal's been cheating he's been arrogant he's not the type of person you would want holding the title anymore um and especially ironic for being a member of and assumingly the assumed leader now of what's left of the foundation he says all this talk last couple months about restoring ring of honor resurrecting it Restoring respect, restoring, you know, the the honor of it all. Restoring the how about how about restoring the glory? I mean, who who's been our champions lately? Who were our previous champions? One almost killed the company, and what did we do after that? We we put it on on what Samoa Joe that slob. It's this beautiful title is just languished for years in the hands of rejects and misfits people not worthy but now it's in the hands of a true champion someone you could be proud 
of looking at and saying, yeah, he's my champion. In the hands of the best wrestler in Ring of Honor. The leader of the foundation. Um, that triggers Gresham to come out. Um, the foundation, obviously, having been sort of co-created, led by Gresham, kind of, but kind of started by all of them, about restoring pure rules to Ring of Honor, re- returning it to the old roots. Um, and certainly what Lethal has become is not an embodiment of that, right? And uh, he lays into him about it. He was a leader. The foundation was our empire to restore honor to the ring of honor. All the things so far that we believed in, you've already cast it aside. You know, you used, we used to fight for a cause together. But now your, your antics they show exactly who you are. There's no honor in you. So the two go back and forth, obviously, and eventually Lethal just kind of lays it out and says, oh, so I know what this really is about. You want this title back, don't you? And he grins, like, well, sorry. You know, you have to be this tall to ride Big Lethal Mountain. How about you go back in the line, and when you get a few inches, you come back and we can have a match. He kind of just pushes them aside and brushes them off and walks away. So we have that cracks in the foundation there. Lethal and Gresham not seeing eye to eye. Uh, Lethal not caring about what he started the foundation about. Really just caring about keeping power and Gresham still looking about focusing on restoring the idea of that pure wrestling spirit, that honorable nature of the company. Um, so obviously the two going to be going to, going to blows, but for now, Lethal not even acknowledging um, Gresham as a equal or even a leg- legitimate competitor at this point. Oh, uh, it's a very short match, but it's uh, not... Great. Subpar wrestling and non-existent crowd heat. We got Willow versus Erica Lay. Um, 39 for Willow. Erica has a 27. Gives us a match as a 28 rating. Got penalties, obviously, because it was a worked crowd match and the crowd was already hot because Jay Lethal talked them up. And uh, because it was so short, but we wanted to give Willow another win. Obviously, she had a, a big win against Diana. Um, her in-ring performance, though, is only a 39, so kind of suffering here. But uh, we're trying to build her up because she's probably going to be our next competitor uh, against Jordan Grace. So that's certainly something we're going to want to build to quickly. Again, we're going to need to look at her stats and see where she really stacks. And I'm guessing the popularity problem is the major driver here. We'll have to look to and see what she could do in a longer match. But I'm um, not happy with that rating. But also, for a five-minute match, its intention was really just to try to build some pop. Not the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination. Now, much better match. Kenta, who last showed up at the end of the pay-per-view after Daniel Garcia... Um, offered a challenge for, I believe, a television title, saying nobody can defeat me. Um, you know, he's Garcia's part, sort of the heir to Suzuki here. Suzuki's been kind of hanging around with them, being a tag partner, being a mentor and instructor, and um, has started to train him. And it seems like uh, Kenta came out to kind of accept the challenge, but he's hanging around first. Uh, Kenta is, of course, our IWGP US champion. And he is uh, here, you know, just having an exhibition match, showing his skill, uh, fighting Lee Moriarty. Gives him a GTS. Uh, the only person in wrestling that actually does that move. Really weird. It's odd. No one else has ever tried to do the go to sleep. Don't know why. It only stuck with one person, but it's just how it went, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Kenta defeats Lee Moriarty in 20 minutes uh, by pinfall. 
Kenta had a 65. Lee had a respectable 55. Figured this would give Lee a little bit of something to do. Even with the loss, fighting against Kenta was probably going to be a benefit to his popularity. We'll check it and see if that's true. Uh, overall, gets us a 64, though, which is a very good rating for this match. Afterwards, uh, we have a, a, just a small segment here. Uh, Kenta wins, the announced that he won, and uh, Suzuki and Garcia exit from Gorilla to kind of stare them down, stare them down, kind of say, we see you, you showed up and interrupted us last time, and just kind of make their presence known. They could attack him, they could not, kind of gauging how his reaction is to him, right? Kenta just stares back, looking completely unafraid, uh, walks up to Garcia and stares him down for a bit and kind of gives him just a little, little pat on the the shoulder, and then walks away behind him, uh, not afraid at all of Suzuki or Garcia, and uh, definitely not backing down. This does very well. We advance the storyline that Garcia's in. Uh, Garcia is looking good because he has a uh, flavor of the month sort of uh, internet wrestling persona, so he's kind of building up from that momentum. Of course, this gets a 51. I mean, out there, Suzuki's out there just being menacing, so not shocking. Afterwards, we have Willow backstage um, cutting a promo or an interview. We need to get an interviewer on Ring of Honor. I, I noticed that we didn't have anybody that actually can cut a, uh, like a do an interview segment. Uh, so she's just talking to somebody, and she's about to talk about you know her big win against Deanna, and before she could even talk about anything, Jordan Grace, who's been bullying people all the time, has decided to uh, uh, attack, surprise her, and ends up laying her out. Uh, kind of beats her up pretty nasty, just making sure that Willow knows who's on the pecking order. Uh, Jordan, a very non-respectable champion for the Women's Championship, attacking a fan favorite babyface. Uh, Second, gets a 41. It's actually not too bad, and then we build some heat for uh, the Willow versus the Goliath storyline between Jordan and, Will and Willow Nightingale. Fresh off his big win, Joe Hendry comes out and has a match against Colt Cabana, another entertainer um, of sorts. And he defeats Colt Cabana 10 minutes, uh, gives him a freak of nature, but after a distraction from uh, Jazim Salmani, so his muscle um, is able to sort of give him the distraction, and Hendry's able to get the pinfall, uh, beats Colt after 10 minutes, and uh, continues to build that momentum. Again, it's starting to question, though, if he can really pull it off, if he didn't have this unfair advantage of having such a, uh, uh, you know, large and imposing uh figure at his side to run distractions, run interference if needed. That's obviously how Dalton Castle lost ultimately and now is forbidden from ever challenging Hendry in a match again. He, Hendry doesn't even want to be around him. This match ultimately gets a pretty good score. 46 for a 10 minute match. It's under um, it's, it, it actually it's not under it looks like for what it was, because it didn't have any stars, so we were okay there. But it did have sort of that cheap match um, issue, right? Uh, so this this product does have fans get turned off by finishes that are like cheap or, or tainted in some capacity, have DQs, interferences. I actually think that's a little wrong, and I might have to look at to see if there's a better product. But I feel like that actually works better. It, it may turn off people if it's used too much, but I think in this type of product for a Ring of Honor, it works immensely well to build heat because that's the thing that you're not supposed to do, right? So I don't know. Um, let me know what you guys think. If, if it, we have to look and see if there's a better product or if, if we just have to deal with the penalties, even if a character should be doing it. I mean, end of the day... 
it really didn't affect that much. We got a 46. It probably would have been like a 47 or 48. We're not talking about big penalties here. So very happy with this for, for given for what this is. Got the crowd buzzing. It's a little too hot for what we want going towards the main event. But I do believe I have a cooldown match to calm the crowd. Another shorty. So hopefully that um, sucks the life out and, and gets people back to more of a reasonable uh, reasonable tempo uh, because we have a long match. We have a, a spectacle coming up. A, you know, three great tag teams fighting a long match and we do not want them to burn out. So hopefully we can control that. We'll see. Uh, after the match, Hendry cuts a quick promo. We're talking real quick, just like a minute. Um, he says, nobody's more entertaining than him. Nobody is true, more deserving to be in Ring of Honor than him. Nobody's a better wrestler than him. Joe Hendry's the complete package. Uh, he's a, a, a true, uh, you know, diamond in the rough. And he's going to show everybody, right? And he's going to show also what happens when people dare to stand in his way. And Colt looks really confused because he's like, wait, what? And then immediately uh, Jazim attacks and ends up laying out Colt Cabana. Uh, so Hendry's got this sort of weird God complex. He seems like he's got a chip on his shoulder about entertaining wrestlers, like like almost like like Hendry wants to be more legitimate, and he's kind of like trying to move away from his previous um, history of sort of being kind of not a comedy wrestler, but you know he's got laughs and he wants to be serious. So it seems like he's got beef with people that are more of the entertaining side, um, and certainly uses his muscle to beat up poor Colt Cabana. Segment gets a forty-five. Uh, Colt Cabana going to need to uh, maybe get some cash out of the bank account that he shares with his mother to uh, pay for the medical expenses that he just incurred, but uh, he'll be okay. We got Brian Cage versus Jimmy Lloyd. Here's that cooldown match. Um, it's too short because it's supposed to be important because Cage is a star, but that's fine. We'll suffer from it. It's not a big deal. This is going to be a stinker of a match anyways. The goal of this entirely was just to bring the crowd back down. Um, so Cage kind of controlled that tempo in a very short match. Two and a minute. Um, comes out. Tries to get people down to a slower pace. Get them a, a little bit calmer. Heads up laying out Jimmy Lloyd in two minutes. And um, he, he does. He looks good. He's 51. Um Versus Jimmy Lloyd actually not even doing too bad here with a 37. I mean, he's this is one of his matches where even he loses going against Cage, having a decent looking match. Well, not decent in terms of segment, but having a match with Cage probably will help him uh, just kind of get more eyes, get popularity. But he takes the pin here, and Cage uh, ultimately beats him in a very quick showing. Afterwards, Tully Blanchard's out there with Brian Cage, and uh, Tully just says, nobody can, uh, can withstand the machine. Everybody that's going to face him will fall uh, all the way until he becomes Ring of Honor champion. So, calling out, they're looking for belts, right? Two walk away laughing. Uh, nobody comes out to confront them, but they're just kind of calling it out that they're going to start running roughshod on everybody until... Cage gets a title of some sort. Maybe he's going for pure. Maybe he's going for television. Maybe he's going for world. But he's going to be going for the gold at some capacity and uh, going to break people to get there. This does very well. Tully's great on the mic. It's a sh nice, short, and sweet little segment. And Cage is just over there posing, looking menacing. So works out perfectly. And we got a hype package before. The main event. We got the Briscoes and FTR and the Bucks. And in there, interspersed with quick cuts of, you know, them and matches, it's just them talking about how important the belt is. The Bucks are talking about how it's like the first belt that really made them who they are. Um, the Briscoes say they live and breathe that belt. And, you know, FTR say it, 
that they're all about being the best tag team in the world, and you can't be the best tag team in the world unless you hold the Ring of Honor titles. So, you know, is this about the belt? It's important because of how important the belt is to them, they all say, and it's important because pro wrestling is so important to them. So they're all talking it up, talking about the prestige of the tag belt. Obviously, the Briscoes have taken it back from FTR. Uh, the Bucks being into the mix is going to cause a whole bunch of commotion. Uh, we actually lose some heat here because of just some of the previous segments, but it um, won't matter because we're about to hit the main event. And it's a 71. Uh, it's superb wrestling, great heat. We got FTR, Briscoes, and the Young Bucks. FTR take the belts again. Um, Dax is able to pin Jay Briscoe with a, getting a big rig so they get that double team on him. Uh, they win the world tag team titles here. Mark Briscoe struggling to, to kind of keep up with everybody. Um, it's a, it is a highly psychological match. It was a spectacle. 27 minute long match, so almost 30 minutes. And we just let them all kind of run it in the ring, no scripting, and, and just get it done. Does very, very well overall here. Got the crowd buzzing, played perfectly, but we are leaving the show with FTR once again becoming tag champions. Uh, putting the Briscoes a bit on the side. So, I mean, technically they're, they're I think, two, two and one. I I have to I would have to take a look, but we get FTR back as champs, and you would have to wonder now also if next spot is is the Young Bucks going to challenge FTR directly, right? Because they had this triple threat. Presumably, you've neutralized the Bucks in some capacity in the match, so that it they're not they didn't take the loss obviously, so they're kind of protected. Um, is the next natural course of things for them to uh to go head to head but for now ftr gets to celebrate and we get the streamers that uh ring of honor is known for to go flying as they hold up the belts once again and end the show on a big victory for ftr and uh surprisingly losing heat for the storyline that's now ending uh but overall, I think that main event is going to make a very good show. And it does. 60 is very good. Um, we are getting penalties because of our production values, but we're not going to touch them. We, we, we be, we're competing with NXT on that. It's just unreasonable. Overall, though, uh, a pretty solid show. It was more of a building show, but that one main event really boosted our ratings here and gave us a popularity boost in 28 regions that this was aired in. Uh, and I'm sure all 374 people there thought this was an excellent uh, regular TV taping. All right. Um, whoa, that's a weird one. It's rumored that Minoru Suzuki is set to leave New Japan Pro Wrestling after apparently not being offered a contract extension. Uh, that's wild, but... You know, things get weird in these saves sometimes. But uh, let's see how the how we stacked up here. Show was awesome. So, very good. Um, Dax Harwood, his opinion. Matt Seidel is clumsy. I cut him loose before someone gets hurt. Well, thanks, Dax. Uh, viewing figures, about 500,000 500, people, over almost 550,000 people saw our show, so that's very good. Uh, that's going to be very, very good for our popularity. And overall, very happy with how that show shaked out. Um, like, really happy. I, I think that's very solid. Next episode, we'll take a look at some of our uh, popularity between some of our top wrestlers. I'm kind of curious to see how they are building um, so that we're hopefully moving them in the right direction. In terms of size, we're up to 40 now, so we're, we are moving along very nicely uh, with quality shows like that. I think we only need to be like nine points higher to boost this up a bit, so if we keep pulling off 60s, 
that'd be great. So overall, very happy with how this one turned out. But that's it for me today. See you guys next time for another episode of Ring of Honor.